Hi, I'm Alian from Patrick and Poodles, and today we are going to make four at a time flying geese. There are many patterns out there that ask for four at a time flying geese, and there are several reasons why. The first is that it's really fast. You make four, um, it goes a lot faster than making them each individually. The second reason being that there is very little waste with four at a time flying geese, which is definitely a huge plus. The third thing that you'll notice about four at a time flying geese is that all four of these were made out of the same fabrics together. Two of them, the stripes are going horizontally, and two, the stripes are going vertically. This is a benefit when you are making any sort of pattern that within the block you need four geese because, let's say I was making a sawtooth star, if I go and place all of these, now you'll notice that all of my stripes are all pointing the same way. So this method works really great for directional fabrics and it allows you to not have to think about directional fabrics as you're cutting your fabrics. You can go ahead and make your geese and have them be directional um, as you're making them. There are several Patrick and Poodles patterns that ask for four at a time flying geese. We have Harvest Star, Etoile, and Inkling. And I have an Inkling block to show you what that looks like, especially with directional fabrics. So here's Inkling, and you'll notice this really cute Beauty and the Beast fabric, and here are my flying geese. One, two, three, four. So this is a very directional, one direction print of Belle on her horse with the castle, and all four of these have the print facing the correct way. This is really easy to do with four at a time flying geese, and I have a whole blog post that tells you how to set up your fabrics so that you're able to get that really nice continual pattern across all of your geese. So let's get started. What you essentially need to make four at a time flying geese is one big square and one, two, three, four little squares. I have marked my squares with a pen, and I'll talk about marking in a second. Usually I mark them with a hair marker, but I thought this might be a little difficult for you to see, so I've gone ahead and used a pen. So how do you know what size you need? It's a really nice handy dandy formula. If you're using any pattern out there on the market that asks you to make four at a time flying geese, they will have automatically done the math for you and told you what size to cut your squares. If you want to make flying geese for a different project, Here's the formula that you'll need. We have the height, the finished height of our flying geese unit. We'll use this guy as our example, right? Finished height and finished width. So this is unfinished. You'll notice I haven't trimmed it, I haven't sewed it into my block. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what it's going to look like finished. So your finished height and your finished width, once I trim this and sew it up, this one will be uh, 4 inches by 2 inches. So we'll use that as our example. You'll notice with flying geese units that the width is always double the height. So this is going to be 4 inches finished, that means that this is 2 inches high finished. The first formula I'm showing here is the traditional one that I've always found when I looked online. Finished width, this guy, so we're 4 inches, plus 1.25 inches, that's your large square, that's this guy here. Finished height, this guy, right, plus 7 eighths of an inch. That's what you need to cut your full, four small squares at. I don't necessarily love this for two reasons. One is that now I have to cut a square, these little guys, at two and seven eighths inches. I don't really like cutting at seven eighths at all. The second reason I don't like it is it doesn't leave you a lot of room for trimming. And I'm a big fan of trimming um, only because if you're not 100% accurate in your sewing, you can make up for it when you have a little bit more leniency in trimming. So this is the one that I recommend, and I have a blog post on this as well. So you can go to patrickandpoodles.com slash blog, and you'll be able to find all of this information um, on that blog. So here we have finished width plus one and a half inches, and that's gonna be our large square. Finished height plus one inch, and that's our four small squares. So today we're gonna make flying geese that finish at two inches high by four inches wide, like this guy here. And so what I've done is I've actually cut all of these using this formula here. Our finished width, we want four inches plus an inch and a half. So this is a five and a half inch square. This is my big guy. 
And what happens in four at a time flying geese is this guy actually gets cut into fours to make that triangle shape in the center. So if you think about this sort of thing, you know, you cut it, you cut it, and now it's starting to look like a flying geese unit. So that's how you remember your big one equals whatever goes in the middle. Your little ones are gonna be the outside. So these are finished height, two inches plus one inch. So we have four three inch squares. On the back side of all your small squares, you're going to mark a line diagonally through all of them. Again, I have used a pen. I don't necessarily re recommend a pen. I would recommend a hair marker, a water soluble marker, a chalk pencil, or even a mechanical pencil, but something that isn't going to um, potentially bleed or ruin your fabrics when you're cutting and using steam and washing it down the road when your quilt is all done. Um, that would be really, really sad. So I have used pen just to show you, but I don't recommend pen. On the back side of all your small squares, there's a line diagonally. We're going to take our large square, we're going to put two of the small ones aside, and we are going to line them up. One here, and one here. They do overlap, they are supposed to overlap, so that is good. What we're trying to do is we're going to line them up on the two corners here, and then the overlap is just what it's going to be. You can go ahead and put a couple pins if you want to keep things um, staying in the spot that you want them to stay as you go to the sewing machine. We are going to sew a quarter of an inch seam away from the line on both sides. So here's our line here. We're gonna sew a line a quarter of an inch away on this side and a quarter of an inch away on this side. We're gonna go over to our sewing machine and we're gonna get that done. Okay, so this is what it's gonna look like. I've got my line in the middle that I've drawn a quarter of an inch away, I have one stitch line, and a quarter of an inch away on the other side, I have another stitch line. So this is how our first part of our flying geese is completed. Now we're gonna take our scissors, and we're gonna cut on the line that we drew. You can also use your rotary cutter for this, um, but I just, I always have scissors handy near my sewing machine, so I just go ahead and cut them apart. Okay, so now we have two of these guys, what we need to do is we need to press them so that we can add the other piece to it. I like to press open. There's always a lot of debate in the quilting world, world whether you press open or you press to the side. I find with flying geese units, however, the center part is going to get really bulky because now look, there's two already, two, three folds of fabric. We're going to be adding one more. It gets to be a really bulky spot, so I recommend at least for flying geese, press open. So give it a little, a little bit more press. I usually like to use steam, but we are doing this on the fly. So I'm using my little wool pressing mat, which I love, and my travel iron. And I will link those supplies in the description below as well. Okay nice and flat, move this out of the way so we can do our next step. So now we have two of these. And if I fold them in half, oh, they're starting to look like flying geese, right? So we've got half of our flying geese background. Um, we just need to figure out the other side. So we're gonna do that with the last two remaining pieces that we have. Again, there was a line drawn in the center and the line is gonna line up from this corner and here. So we're gonna again line it up on the corner of our large square and it's going to overlap and we want it to, that's good. If I folded this over, you'd see, oh, it's starting to look like flying geese. We're on the right track. I'm gonna put a little pin in there so that it'll stay in the spot that I have it in. And I'm gonna repeat that with my last remaining small square and my other unit. There we go. I'm going to take these over to my sewing machine and I'm going to sew a quarter of an inch seam away from the line on both sides. So just like we did for the first part, now we're going to repeat that for both of these units. And here we are. So here's my line, quarter of an inch away, I've sewn on both sides. Um, and you'll notice that um, it extends all the way through into this background fabric, which is what we want. 
We are going to cut these apart just like we did for the first part of the flying geese. This always seems a little scary because you're cutting into your fabric and you ah, can't go back, but I promise you, this is what we want it to look like. Okay, so now I have four units. We're gonna go ahead and press these open again. Nice bulky spot going on with all these fabrics up here. Look how many layers that is. So we are gonna go and press this open with our travel iron. It's really nice to have a little iron like this right next to your sewing machine. Then you can toggle back and forth really easily. And there we are, a beautiful flying geese unit. I'm gonna press the rest of these, I'll have four of them. Um, don't worry about these little tails going on. These will get trimmed off when we trim our flying geese. I have a video to help you trim your flying geese perfectly, so make sure you check that out as well. Thanks for watching.